Welcome back, everybody. Uh, we're actually getting into a game. Uh, it looks like Gothic Knights took a little bit longer, but we're going to be heading into game right now. And I'm very happy to be here as we go into our lower semifinals, SNHU Blue versus NJCU Gothic Knights. This is a team that we faced before back in week nine, so very recently, just two weeks ago, uh, and we actually ended up taking that set two to one. So hopefully you get to see a little bit uh, a little bit of new tricks here coming out from the Gothic Knights as they look to try and fight back against SNHU here, looking to fight for their place in the lower finals. What's up? I think he's doing a great job uh, with this Joker. Hasn't taken a hit yet and got 75 off. Just barely missed that tipper. Getting a good ledge grab. And it seems like Insignia is just in this entire last game and this game been playing so confident. Oh, yeah. SNHU definitely have been feeling themselves tonight. That last game was a super great performance for them versus uh, the Eagles. So now going forward into this, they've definitely got to be feeling pretty hot. Uh, definitely a little bit of time to kind of cool themselves down, but still on top of their game, practicing that entire intermission here. But we're seeing Rampage get a lot of pressure here on stage. Insignia having a tough time getting back up. We'll be able to get right back in, but actually just fighting over the corner right now around the ledge is going to be very tough. And Rampage is doing a good job playing around his max range but insignia still finding an opportunity to actually get in and find some value but a good grab from rampage is going to buy up some uh, some space yeah it, it, insignia in general play style very zonery very juggle type of play style with corin which is exactly what you want to do but this means that insignia's advantage stays really good but their disadvantage is going to have some trouble especially with joker who also has such a strong advantage state so it seems like this is going to be really momentum based game uh and mostly just juggling and combos but great upbeat to see a lot of that stuff I gotta say, I really do like Insignia's choice to play the core in here over Bowser. Definitely a much more kind of stable character in these sort of situations, especially when you're leading in. You really don't want to have to worry about counter picks too much. Corrin kind of uh, re really being that sort of more all-rounder character as compared to Bowser is really, really good for Insignia as he looks to try and start off with a really strong lead here. Our sudden coming out from Rampage is going to give him a little bit of a boost as he tries to get back up on a stage, but it'll be Insignia who just goes a little bit too far in and it is going to end up almost paying the price there almost gets sent off the side and this time oh, finally will evening things up two to two yeah that's very unfortunate second hit of that dash attack hitting on ledge with that neutral get up but it looks like insignia did a pretty good job sealing out that first stock and it looks like rampage is at 80 or sorry 100 now with that back air but insignia going so deep but that uppy will send so far it looks like that di wasn't necessarily the best not really expecting to be sent that far that hard Seeing now Insignia right back into the action, gonna try and immediately apply some pressure here. Rampage really wants to try and buy some space, zone a little bit, and start to build up some of his meter to actually be able to get Arsene out uh, very early into this. Gonna give him a really a big momentum boost at the start of the stock, but Insignia knows that he wants to do this and immediately gonna start to rush him down, find some big damage there on those combos, start to get him up towards some pretty high percentages, and now gotta worry about landing into him. We'll be able to, a good throw, gonna lead into some combo damage there, but a nice pin kick is gonna be able to follow up there, and Insignia! could just end it absolute amazing read on that jump going for that back air you know one of corin's best kill moves very well played by insignia the entire game just so much momentum behind his character and juggles the entire set yeah really impressive play there from insignia and he's been playing like this all night he is definitely not getting tired at all uh continuing to go through into this and that's definitely something you got to worry about especially when you're going into these crew battles and going into them back to back njcu just finished their match against golden gales so they're also coming right off of another match here and it's going to be a bit of an endurance test for these teams especially once you start to get into you know games two and three of these crew battles it can really kind of start to take a toll on your stamina um how many games you just have to play and how many opponents you're gonna have to fight yeah it's that's one of the big things but that also does keep people in practice that keeps them warmed up uh allowing for these games to go on as long but the one thing that can happen is nerves can kind of get to you towards the end but it looks like snhu and even to some extent gothic knights weren't seemingly playing that anxious they were going in they were getting their kill confirms it's just it looked like insignia was winning neutral a little bit more and was able to juggle juggle joker a fair bit and joker just couldn't get out of disadvantage it's not what the character does and speaking of nerves here if we could pull a bracket up real quick we're getting very close to the end game here in our playoffs the northeast cruise playoffs blue if they take this game they're moving on to lower finals both this team or both blue and gothic knights are 
you know, tournament life on their line, or tournament life on the line, uh, really are fighting tooth and nail here to be able to try and make their way forward into the lower finals where they're going to have to fight one of two, this is the old bracket, but um, where they're going to have to fight one of two of the Fisher College teams that will make their way down as those yeah. two fight in the upper finals. Yeah, Fisher Fisher is kind of like the big rivals in general of basically everyone. Like they're they're the top seed. They're known about for having some of the best esports in the region. Um, but you know, it, it, being this far in lower semifinals is abs. It's just super impressive uh, for SNHU and our team in general. Like we've seen how much every player has grown. Like Insignia has definitely been showing corn a lot more, has grown grown so much with the character. And we've seen Steven also, who at the start of the season proved themselves on New Hampshire ranked ladder, I believe, getting um into uh top six or top eight. Um and it has been pulling off some of the most insane combos. Like every player on the team has improved so much. And I just love to see how it has how it has manifested into this run. And character pool is really everything here. Something that we've seen a lot from Insignia, especially we, we saw this just last set as well versus the uh, uh, versus the Eagles. But uh, Insignia busting out the cloud it, and just having that sort of versatility, being able to pull out the right character for the matchup and characters that you're really tried and true on is so important in crew battles. You have to have a deep character pool because sure crew battles is a format where character specialists can really thrive because you sort of get to pick your matchups. But if you win, then you get counterpicked. And so yeah. having these characters who have really good sort of matchup charts is so important. And that's one of the big things in general is you see a lot more specialized like mid-tier or sorry, unspecialized mid-tier is just like generalists like Mario, like Corrin, like Falco succeed a lot better than you see like specific things like, I don't know, like Nestor or Lucas, um, which are more just very specialized characters. Um, but yeah, Insignia playing Corrin is definitely a lot better into this. Um, and at least for this matchup specifically, I could see also this being a good matchup for Corrin in general. He is down a stock, so Insignia is going to have to worry about kind of holding on to his ground here. If they play at pace with each other, it's going to be Insignia who ends up getting knocked out of this set. So we'll see now as Zamu starts to make his presence on stage known. Samus is going to have a little bit of a hard time actually zoning out uh, sorties like Korin and like the other Fire Emblem characters who really are able to control a lot of space themselves. More so, uh, very much kind of mid-screen spacing characters are really able to kind of encroach on these zoners like Samus and really uh, stop them from running their game plan. Also, especially because Korn has such weird movement options with side B and on top of that, we're going, being a juggle care. Oh my god! He went so deep for that, that back air. That was that pretty was crazy. insane. Uh, yeah. Insignia. insignia has been doing that all game though. Oh, that didn't kill. Garchomp barely not killing, but nice. actually falls off for another one. Following Insignia, just tracking them, waiting for them to get close enough where there wasn't really lag behind that charge shot. Very well played by Zamu. But Insignia in general um, is just like so good at landing those very deep hits. Like we've seen it a couple times with their side bees. Uh, so yeah, definitely, definitely one of the better attributes to Insignia's play so. It's very smart for Zamu to actually start to pick up the pace a little bit and start to move in more as opposed to trying to zone out because, like I mentioned, Korn's really going to control a lot of space. You have to be the one to actually uh, play aggressive here and we'll be able to get back onto the ledge guard that hit and now we're going to really struggle at trying to land here into Insignia. Uh, just needs to really sort of stabilize and establish some presence on the stage itself, which is being a little bit of a problem right now. Yeah, that's one of the hard parts versus Corrin. A jump read on that back air. Uh, Corrin se or Insignia seems to have the download on Zamu's playstyle right now, especially with that uh, forward smash that we saw hit earlier in the set. Seems like Insignia just knows exactly what the Samus wants to do. See here, Zamu is able to get back on stage and now starting to pressure Insignia on the ledge, but a pin in the air is going to be able to get Insignia's ticket back in. Zamu going up high now has Insignia off stage, trying to drop the bombs on him, trying to get some pressure here. He'll be able to block a good few hits there, get the back air by some distance and start to actually zone a little bit here. Get some screen space before starting to change things up a little bit. And now just has to try and withstand Insignia's pressure here. A good dash attack's going to find some big screen space as Insignia on the ledge, so close to a good kill percent here, is able to find some great openings on Zamu there, but a good throw into the air, gonna buy a lot of stage space, but Zamu just can't quite follow up on it. 
That was that was so close. Both that forward smash and that grab were so close to hitting. But the parry on that charge missile, uh, very well placed. And that side B just barely doesn't tip her, but Insignia might try to go deep. Nice. Gets stopped by the charge shot, though. Looks like Insignia will charge up the forward smash to read that. Roll read in, but it looks like Samus has to go high right now. Just sort of baiting out with their bombs, using tether grab to get back. Insignia trying to go for that side B, but pulls away safely. Forward air coming out from Samus right now, and an up air will actually catch Insignia, just barely not killing. But Insignia is at death's door right now. 159, 162, and Samus has center stage. That Whoa. up, he might just be it. That's what I'm talking about with being on pace, right? Crew Battles is a very different beast from what you typically see in tournaments, right? Insignia, I'd say that was a pretty very much uh, evenly sealed matchup right there, but Insignia came in down a stock, and that meant that uh, Zamu was just barely able to eke that one out with one stock remaining. Now, they're going to go into the next match already at a pretty big disadvantage here, so not a huge lead for the Gothic Knights, but definitely stabilizing things a good bit for themselves and not going down there, and actually going to actually uh, start to do a little bit of damage towards more of SNHU Blues players, uh, finally getting through Insignia. One thing that I kept trying to say, but I didn't have time because the match was going on so quickly, uh, was that, uh, yeah, Corrin specifically is a good matchup into uh, zoners like Samus because they're not really a big burst type of character like you see out of Roy or Lucino with these combos, but is more of a juggler, more just reading what you're going to do after the light hit combo ends. So they don't really send you far away. They just try to keep you in the air for a long time, which makes it really hard on Samus who has no disadvantage and just wants to camp you. But when you never get sent away, there's really not much that goes on um yeah it's it's a lot it's a lot harder for samus than into like a roll that said you know gothic knights they're getting the ball rolling now getting that first player off of the sticks is such an important part of crew battles because really your opener is a big part of your team composition going into these matches i know it's weird to talk about a fighting game in terms of like team compositions but you really got to think about you know who are you having start things up and insignia it's really important that he didn't make a huge dent into the gothic knights yeah he took five stocks yeah that's pretty scary uh but it's it's way better than him taking six yeah yeah 100 percent uh and that's yeah, that's one of the things that you usually see, um, not in tournament, but towards like normal season where you see these teams just get full sweeped. But now that we're in tournament, teams are playing a lot more seriously. They're VOD reviewing. They're looking at matchup charts. They're actually doing their work to try to knock it as sweeped as much as possible. Um, and yeah, SNHU came out strong, putting their what we usually consider our anchor uh, out front, just doing everything they can to get an early lead. But Gothic Knight still probably has their quote unquote anchor in the back somewhere, which could even things up, which is something you have to watch out for. I'm glad you mentioned uh, matchup charts because they are such a big part of crew battles here. Really just having the right characters for the job and making sure that of you know the five players that you have on your team only only four of them can enter the ring in a given set so you need to make sure that your matchup chart across all four of those players is is very varied and that's something that we see a lot of teams struggling with during the regular season especially where you have a lot of characters who have very similar matchup charts between all four of your players and it can be really sloppy once one character actually shows up that would uh counter that a little bit but we're seeing min min come in here from font diner swanky representing snhu blue how are you feeling about this into samus percent sure min min's one oh. oh that was that was intentional okay they were down a stock they were actually down two stocks i thought they i thought they just sd'd for some reason um but min min in general is uh, i'm not really sure about min min's one of those characters not played a lot but i could see it being pretty good because min min has good overall stage pressure and just about to mention that uh reflector on up smash which i think is pretty good in the samus Zamu trying to find his way in here. It's going to be really hard for him to charge up any sort of projectile just because those super long range pokes are going to come out way faster uh, than Zamu is actually going to be able to dish out a lot of uh, screen pressure. We'll see him trying to land up here using the bombs. I really love the way that Zamu uses the bombs to vary up his landing timing, but he has to be so careful against a lot of these characters. And already at 122%, he's really just looking to try and take as many stocks off of Swanky as possible. Yeah, and that's really the goal right now, is uh, trying to do the best with what you have. And it's going to be hard because actually killing on Min Min with Samus is is kind of a tall order. Um, especially because you can't really charge up charge shot as much as you'd like. But that actually could have been a kill there. Uh, that back air could have oh. to something. But, oh, do they have a jump? They do. Just barely gets back. But, yeah, those bombs just stop any tether grab. 
Wow, really great uh, pressure there from Zamu on, this, on the ledge. Playing a really great ledge game there. We'll see Swanky now coming right back in. Really wants to try and clinch up this set as quickly as possible. Because the longer Zamu is alive, that's going to be the quicker he gets into a kill percent. You can't really avoid just taking damage over time from Samus. Yeah, that's one of the hard parts. And that arm perfectly placed to stop the jump off ledge. Uh, absolutely well played by Swanky and also well played by Zamu. Actually being able to take one stock uh, back, actually making things still even. Yeah, that's really important that you don't actually fall into a further deficit than you were already in. It's all about pace and how many stocks you have above your opponent because that's just going to give you so much more leeway to actually just, you know, play your game uh, and start to apply a lot of pressure. You know, when you have the stock advantage, you can play riskier because you essentially have stocks to spend that the other team doesn't. Yeah, that's one of the big things as well as uh, in general, a big mindset between uh, players getting scared really like uh one thing that you have to watch out for at least in smash is like reading whether they're going to roll out or roll in and usually scared players or players who are on the defense um end up rolling out and it's a very big thing for gothic knights to not let their overall stock deficit mess with the way that they play inside of the game itself because you still have to play like it's an actual like normal set you still have to play with the amount of randomness that you normally would with rolls so it's very important to keep your mental strong uh, even when you're down. And mental goes both ways, right? It can be just as intimidating going into a game with a stock lead, knowing that, hey, if I mess up, I could blow a t I, could, I could blow this lead for our team. That's a lot of a lot of pressure right there, especially if you know you're going into one of the team's stronger players. You can really get in your own head about potentially how this game could impact your team's run overall, right? It's not just like a, a typical 1v1 bracket where it's just your life on the line. You've got to worry about the three other people who are yep. behind your back watching every move you make and you know if you throw away one of those stocks that's gonna be very very much tolling on the mental game well one of the things that i've learned from playing games in general is that you're only as good as your weakest as weak as you are which is usually your autopilot so you have to play games you have to get good at training yourself to be really good at your weakest point because yeah you know if like random john johnson from south carolina was playing 10 out of 10 their absolute best they've ever played in their entire life they could probably get top five but on average you're not going to be playing 10 out of 10 you're going to be playing more like four out of five or like six out of five ish somewhere in that range so you have to make sure that your average is as good as it should be and you have to play the game like it's without any stress like People will sometimes get in their heads, but really when you're sitting down, you have to think of playing it as you're playing a friend at home. You have to just do your best, let your autopilot take over and make sure your autopilot is as good as it has to be. A hundred percent. It is so important just to, you know, how much you practice and, and like really building up your peak is important, but it's really all about consistency, especially in tournaments, right? You can be, I mean, that's also, you'll see a lot of, uh, a lot of fighting games. You'll see a lot of characters who have a really potentially high peak. But they can struggle a lot in tournaments just because maybe their matchup charts aren't great or just because they're a little bit inconsistent. And you see that in characters as well in a lot of crew battles. You know, you think of characters like K. Rule, right? They've got gr or they've got not so great matchup charts. Uh, and, and the matches where they do win and matches where K. Rule players are really popping off, you can see a lot of strength there. But you really have to worry about that weak side. Yeah, there's like two consistent examples of this within Smash and then outside of Smash. The first one being Ice Climbers. Ice Climbers have some of the highest potential mm -hmm. in the game in Ultimate. Not not only Melee, which they're amazing in Melee, but in Ultimate, they have one of the highest potentials. But the problem with them is that actually landing everything consistently is so hard that it's just an inconsistent character that you need to have like future vision to actually play at the highest level. It's impossible. And the same thing goes for like speedrunning. You have a general game term, right? Oh, yeah. Is that speedrunners will go for some more consistent strategies rather than the faster one. Like technically in Mario 64, to get through the wall, you can just walk off the plank. But there's this setup that they do where they have to grab onto the ledge, they do a punch, they rotate, they turn. They have a whole consistent setup. And even though it takes a couple milliseconds longer, they'll do that because it's more consistent to an hour long run. And that's also how you have to think of characters, mental, how you play in general. You know, you have to play most consistently 
where you are. You have to make sure your autopilot is as good as it needs to be rather than like, oh, like it's my best time I've ever played in my entire life. And and that's why a lot of the times, you know, it's very easy to fall into the pit, especially when you're watching esports, of being like, oh, I wouldn't play like that. In this situation, I would win, right? I, I would simply just do this other strategy. But everyone you see on these streams, and this doesn't just go for Smash, this goes for everything, right? They're taking measured risks. They're, they're, they're kind of evaluating like, hey, I could do this strategy that would pay off a ton if it actually worked, but... Actually, being consistent is so much more important. You can try and gamble it all, all you want every single time, but do you really want to throw your tournament life just uh, with a roll of the dice? Like, hey, maybe this works, maybe it doesn't. Of course not. You're going to go for the very consistent things, and you're going to go for things that maybe are a little bit less flashy, but just are, are more safe. Like, a great example of this with me personally is I've beaten Diamond players in League, but can I consistently beat them? No, <laughs> right. no, yeah. no. No, that was kind of just a fluke of the moment match where they made a bad decision. Like, you have to just be consistent. And, and the biggest thing as well is mental and teams mental. And the one thing that Matt, one of the other casters, constantly talks about is how close the Smash team is. Like, out of all of the teams, all of the teams at SNHU, I'd say at least my pick for the closest team, the, mo the one with the most team support, the energy just around the Smash team is just so beautiful, so lively. Uh, compared to like other teams that I see, like you look at esports teams, you hear stories about fighting all the time. But with the Smash team, it's literally like their family. And in general, oh, yeah. the Smash community is just so tight knit. So you see these players building each other up rather than tearing each other down. And like they'll laugh, uh, laugh off like falls. Like I like earlier in the season, I forget who did it, but someone SD'd, and they just ended up laughing about it. They're like, "Oh, my bad, no, no big deal." And that's the mental that you really need going into it. And that's the mental you need as a team. You need people who can keep the team's mental in the hardest situations up as much as possible. And you also got to think about like, uh, that's a little bit of the opposite of what you'd expect, especially with this team, because while, while we do see crew battles on stream, that's not the only thing they're competing in. They're entering local tournaments. They're entering tournaments like Granite State Grind, right? Where they are individual players. They are no longer on a team. They are just representing the school. And oftentimes they have to play against each other and potentially eliminate each other, hearing that they are so close. And I definitely, I, I guarantee that this, this sort of uh, going back and forth between team play and crews and then individually fighting each other it's a very humbling experience for a lot of teams which you might you might uh, you know hear a lot about esports teams having issues with like players with ego i think definitely having uh times where you're just like hey 1v1 me in this tournament and we'll see who's better definitely helps uh, kind of build a little bit more understanding and, and a bond of sort of yeah. where your place is on the team also in general it's the idea around sort of fighting games oh it looks like we're about to get into match uh pac-man pac-man Okay. God. I'm interested. I'm I'm buying in. Okay. Purple's got me sold. I'm excited to see the Okay. Pac all right. Pac-Man versus Min Min. I I Okay. All right. This uh this is a match I've never seen. This is like straight out of Japan. Like these are the two like one of the most played characters in Japan is both of these characters. Pac-Man, right? He is one of those characters where he really looks to manipulate a lot of items a lot of the time. Uh, and characters like that are ones that can struggle a little bit with uh, consistency, uh, which can be an issue. And I think uh, I think they might just be waiting for Swanky to SD. Yeah, I think they might have forgotten that they were at eight stocks right there. But as uh, we go in, is he down one stock? Is our is our uh, is our count wrong? I don't know. I guess he's in one stock. I guess he's oh, dead. I think that was a button warmer. <laughs> I think that's okay. what that was. Um, All right, button warmer. But yeah, I, I'm, I'm excited to see the Pac-Man. Just item manipulation yeah. characters in general are are very fun, and I I, I think especially looking at a uh, just the the kind of clips that they can hit sometimes uh, are really crazy. Because when you fight against characters like Pac-Man, like Peach, you can be like, oh no, I'm in a Twitter clip. Pac-Man is a character with so much potential that isn't utilized. I feel like I feel like this character is like one of those shadow top tiers, but it's just so hard to get into them because item manipulation is such like a specific thing that you have to get good at that you don't really see a lot of Pac-Mans, but like Pac-Man's not only a projectile character, this man can also scrap. Like they have combos, fair, fair, just over and over again, dragging someone to edge. It's really good. Uh, yeah, Pac-Man is just one of those characters that kind of has everything. They also have the best grab in the game. 
So, and that's like undebatable at this point, I think. Mo I think every, most ultimate players will agree with that. Seeing already some pressure starting to come out from these items, from the fire hydrant, especially run ledge is where things are going to get really scary because you start getting in those setups where it's like, okay, my ledge options are incredibly limited by the amount of projectiles that are coming my way, and I really need to think very heavily about what I'm doing. Uh, actually getting hit by oh, his own fire hydrant. hydrant there. Purple, trying to find a way back up, will be able to. That side B is so good for Pac-Man's recovery game. Oh. He can spend so much time off stage. Actually is able to get right back up on the ledge there. Very high percent already, but we'll see if he's able to find something. Min Min going off stage is something that I don't normally see a lot because Min Min's recovery is probably the worst part of their kit. Uh, but yeah, it looks like they're stuck on platform right now, but both players are doing an insanely good job right now. Uh, Pac-Man's doing a great job using items, but Min Min's pressure with those arms just doesn't let Pac-Man charge up their neutral be really as much as they should. Like, even off let Oh, Bell, oh. smash. The final smash came out, you know? Pac-Man's forward smash. That was beautiful. But Absolutely. purple's purple is so high percentage right now. You gotta yeah. be so scared if you're him, especially Min Min. Just finding these pokes at long range is not particularly hard for this character, and so you really have to play aggressive. You cannot give Swanky the space that he needs to start to pressure you with his long range pokes. Yeah, that's one of the biggest things. Uh, is that it's it's just really hard for Pac-Man to really find agency on the map. But the problem is Min Min has such a bad disadvantage that now that Pac-Man is center stage, it's just a kind of just a train of projectiles that they can't really get rid of. Uh, shielding the Hydrant though, switching back to Chakrams, uh, it seems like that'd probably be best option for neutral. And it looks like uh, Swanky's having a bit of trouble actually killing, but that up throw, yup, gonna send perfectly straight up uh, one of Min Min's kill throws, which I didn't know existed until a bit later. Uh, oh, this might be a back throw. I might try to go for something. Yep. Yeah, what do you do here? You jump, nothing happens. Wait, you roll, yeah. nothing. Yeah. You just gotta wait there. If you if you uh, roll up onto the ledge, you hit the trampoline, and you fly directly up into his forward smash. You, you yep. just gotta, you gotta wait and play time. Purple there, respecting that a lot. Definitely doesn't want to push the lead more than he has to, uh, especially with this uh, stock lead that he has in this game. It's it's looking likely that he will take this against Swanky. He just wants to make it as safe as possible. Yeah, that's really the big thing. And Swanky's just trying to get out one more stock, trying to keep things uh, as even as possible. Um, oh, oh, but yeah, no, that fire it's still hydrant active. Bounce. Oh, Pac-Man things. You hate to see things. it. You hate to see it, but it happens. It, it, it could happen to anyone. It could happen to you. Yep. Yeah, I've seen some crazy things with Pac-Man. Like, uh, this character is so good. Like, they have the ability to scrap. They have great ledge trapping. They have great neutral. The character is just so well-rounded. It's just so niche to actually get into them. It's kind of like uh, what we used to talk with, like, Snake. They kind oh, of yeah. plays their own world. You need a specific skill set. Like, you're not really playing ultimate. You're kind of just playing Snake. Same goes with Pac-Man. You're not really playing ultimate. You're not learning the general skills around ultimate. You're kind of learning how to play Pac-Man. This, this uh, is a pack world, yeah. and you're just living in it, essentially. Yeah. I do want to take a little bit of time in between these games to plug Granite State Grind. The semester here at SNH you might be over, and yeah, we're having a pretty nice time on our summer break already, but we're not quite done yet. I mean, playoffs are still happening, and they're going to be happening for a good bit. But Granite State Grind's coming back May 20th. Be sure to mark that down on your calendars. The start.gg page is already up, already on our Twitter. You can sign up if you know you're going to be there. Uh, this is expected to be a pretty big one, too. We're part of the Nessie circuit, so... Uh, by placing well in here, you can actually uh, potentially qualify to be invited to the New England Smash Invitational, which is going to have some pretty big names there. So definitely check out all the information for that on our Twitter. We're expecting this to be one of the most competitive GSGs we've ever had. Oh yeah, we we it's the the people that we've heard are coming are uh, already very interesting. We're getting some people from like Connecticut, which is like a three to four hour drive, which is crazy. I'm super excited to see how it plays out because it is like every GSG has been kind of special in terms of just getting people in into the into the community involved at the program, you know, having people come in and play. It's a lot of fun always, but there's going to be some serious stuff on the line this time. Right. Not only um, are, are you looking at potentially a bigger pot with a with a, a larger entrance or a larger amount of entrance, but you're also looking at 
that really prized uh, entry into the New England Smash Invitational, which is part of, I believe there are six other tournaments running in New England. Yeah, there are, uh, which, uh, which are going to be part of qualifying for this. So GSG really starting to become a big part of the New England scene. You'd love to see it as someone who's been there since the beginning, uh, seeing it kind of flourish and, and grow into a big thing for the Smash community and, and you start to grow actually just a little bit outside of like, you know, the whole esports program at the campus. It's kind of crazy to see, but it's super exciting. Yeah, that's one of the that's one of the most fun parts about esports in general. Here is working on GSG. Um, it's great seeing the Smash community come together. Like uh, fighting game communities in general, are just so so weirdly tight knit and so much more wholesome than you'd see. Like I don't know, like Rainbow or like Call of Duty or League of Legends or really any other esport in general. It's well, just, yeah. it's very nice. It's very, very nice. The fighting game community, you know, it's 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 a pretty niche genre, and there's a lot of people who, you know, think like, oh, here I I would play fighting games, but I'd like them to change this way this way first. But you you know, fighting communities got to stick together. We got to look out for each other, and so uh, this yeah. big event, it's always great to see people come out, show some support, not only for the event itself, but also coming through just to play um, with the Smash Varsity players. It is a great way to actually get your name in and in the door. I know there's a a lot of people who are you know close to finishing up high school who are looking to go to granite state grind who have been to the last few granite state grinds um thinking that they want to get on the smash team and that's a great way to get actually get started yeah definitely and that's a, that's one of the cool parts is that like joining our smash team is like you get the option to get coached by people who are like number one to like number 10 in the state you know you have the option of like working with a coach, doing VOD reviewing, actually have people helping you grow and wanting to see you succeed, uh, which I think is something that's not really offered. There aren't really trainers in, you know, the fighting game scene, like with traditional sports, but this gives you an opportunity to really like improve yourself. Like there was a story about a player, I think on our league team, who was like silver rank, which is like the third, uh, third lowest rank get up to I think it was like the third highest rank which is yeah. a huge improvement um, and just uh, having people coach you having a team behind your back having people wanting to help you succeed it no longer feels as isolating like especially with Smash where you don't have the ability to really play online with your friends because <laughs> Nintendo netcode but you know it, it, it just helps it helps you grow uh and it's a great opportunity especially with how wholesome the community is like you see like toxic people from the community get kicked out all the time like <laughs> low tier crowd and uh other <laughs> other people uh of similar types because the fighting game community it, it's kind of different than team games right because oh, yeah. in team games you kind of blame your team you kind of blame everyone else but with fighting games the only reason to play the games right there's no goal there's no there's no succeeding the pot isn't that big for most fighting games especially with smash the only point to playing the game is to be better and that's it and to be better is not only to be, be better at the game mechanically but to also improve your mental and you see people especially in how grassroots and how unhelpful like the big companies are how grassroots these company or these uh, games are grown, you see people having to work together to actually succeed, to make the prize pools bigger, to actually give people a reason, which is why I feel like it's so tight knit and everyone is so close, especially in fighting games. Uh, and you mentioned how the community is very wholesome, right? I think that there is kind of that, like you mentioned, you know, there's no sort of ulterior motives, right? Like there, there's there's not a ton of money in in the fighting game scene. There's not, you know, the, these big contracts the, the players are fighting for each other for. Um, that there's there's kind of a, a, a sort of there's also uh, no a, a implied respect between fighting game players of like oh this person has dedicated their time to getting better at this game and that is respectable because it is a grind it does take a lot of time uh and that's something that i think is really unique and really important to the fgc uh not that not the other game communities aren't wholesome at all but i think that there is a very certain kind of um friendliness in the fgc that you don't see too many other places I think in general it's just because there's not a lot of reasons as to why even be good at fighting games in the first place except be better like there's no clout behind it. it's not like you can pull up to the function and say like yeah i'm top 20 in mass at smash bros <laughs> and people care you know it's not it's not that big of a deal except to you and the other people who care about the game and want to see you succeed like you've seen some of like the biggest like esports organizations actually grow out of smash like bts for example who were like mainstays with dota and smash bros for so long for so long 
Uh, and you just see players grow. Like Mango, for example, who's uh, one of the top best melee players of all time, um, is the longest running Cloud9 player. Yeah. Longest, I, I think, signed esports player ever, I think, at this point. It's so so sad that you mentioned BTS. Uh, rest in peace. Now they're, they're, yeah. they're, they're, they closed doors. And also, um, with uh, with Shine, I believe, closing down in New England as well. It's mm -hmm. it's really a lot of uh, big hits to the community, which I think is why, especially in a time like this, it's really important to support your local events, right? If you love Smash yeah. Bros, if you love uh, fighting games, anything like that, you know, the, these have, a, a lot of these games don't get, like, big official support from their developers. And so it's really important just to show up to your local scene. You know, you don't even have to compete, but just, uh, just show up, play some games, uh, go home. Plenty of people go to these local locals not to not to enter bracket but just to play with people be right i mean smash is so yeah. hard to actually play with people just because the online isn't that great so there's so many people who go to locals um just to play just to play with friends uh yeah. and, and not really looking to compete not, not looking to play that seriously they see a lot of people at gsg pretty consistently um you know they'll they'll, they'll show up and yeah they, they might play in the bracket they might go oh and two you know they might not they might just show up just to play uh, and we'll see them playing at friendly setups all the way until we close our doors. It, it's it's a really important part of the community just to kind of be around and, and actually play with people that you can sit next to is uh, a really really big uh, sort sort of value in in the FGC and in Smash in general. So going to your locals and just making sure like just show them support is so important, especially just because uh, times are kind of uncertain right now, especially with Smash. Yeah. Well, one reason why I think that like grassroots communities will succeed in general longer is because look at the Overwatch scene, pumped a lot of money into it and then it kind of died. But grassroots are built up from the ground up by the community and there's so much drive from everyone to keep it going. Looks like we're getting in a match though. Quackers pulling up, representing SNHU on the Pokemon Trainer. Love to see it. Pokemon Trainer is such a fun character to watch. The versatility is something that I really like to see in characters. I'm a big fan of, of characters who just do it all. Jack of all trades, master of none. Uh, and that's something that Pokemon Trainer I, re I really connect with there. Just that ability to sort of pull out any tool in the shed and be able to use it with some degree of effectiveness, I, I really enjoy. I agree with that as well. I, I genuinely love watching Pokemon Trainer be played. Uh, it's very annoying to play against, but I don't have to play it because I'm a commentator. So. Yeah, that's one thing to one big stuff. Looks Starting like Quackers is good, doing a good job right now, setting up a nice, easy combo, ledge trapping Pac-Man pretty well, getting just a lot of down airs, back airs, down tilts, uh, doing really what Squirtle likes to do. Yeah, we're seeing, I mean, the neutral game here that Purple is playing is really interesting, right? Because Squirtle is so effective at rushing you down and just applying pressure constantly that Purple is really, I mean, you see him playing a lot of keep away here and just trying to get into a situation where he can get a stray hit on Quackers and then actually start to set up his game plan here. He's got to really focus on being able to set up and buy himself space for that. And we're going to see Quackers switch off of Squirtle as he hits a high percentage just because Squirtle is so light and so easy to kill early yeah. on that you have to to switch off once you hit a certain percent and ivysaur is a really strong character to switch to yeah ivysaur is probably the best character in tra pokemon trainers toolkit like this character has everything probably the best zoner in the game i'd say uh yeah one of the better characters that actually Ooh. caught the role there but not able to be followed up on uh not really oh great grab from ivysaur i rarely ever see that grab it's so long to be used but great read but the apple will kill off top off the bounce off state what Sure. Yeah, and we're gonna Back see Quackers, Quackers switch over to uh, the Charizard now and actually hold on to this. Purple's such a high percentage that Charizard could kill, but we'll actually see him swap off once he gets the chance, and he's gonna pick up the kill with the Fire Hydrant. Squirtle isn't Dude. exceptionally good at killing, but hey, if you put a Fire Hydrant in front of him, anyone can kill. All of all of these all of these kills look so jank. Like anytime you're playing Pac-Man, it just looks like some weird thing you've never seen before happens. Like I'm convinced that that more weird, un unseen things will happen with Pac-Man than any other character. It's Great just because conversion, they, though. There's so many interactions that Pac-Man has that you just don't see on other characters. Uh, and the way he interacts with every single character is very, very different. So you see now Purple's starting to establish some solid mid-stage presence, trying to get in on Quackers, but some good nares are going to buy some space. Force Purple off the ledge. We'll be able to get up with a ledge attack now. 
picking up his item again. Just trying to continue to apply some pressure here. But Quackers, very high percent, is doing a good job of just spacing out with his normals and his tilts. Yeah, doing a good job with Ivysaur right now, just zoning. And that's one of the big things is that you really just have to uh, play against Pac-Man. A lot different, but that Fire Hydrant angle was so dirty. The way Purple plays off the ledge is so interesting. Using his time while falling to be able to spin for items is really big. And it's what allows him to actually get a lot of items in safety. Uh, whereas Quackers could normally just pressure him on stage, he's able to just fall off and knows that he's probably fine at getting back up onto the ledge. Knows he won't get pressured too heavily just because fighting Pac-Man off stage can be a little scary. His recovery is very good. Turn right. We're just going to see Quackers trying anything to desperately get in on Pac-Man. The hardest part, though, is that really Pokemon Trainer's big way of getting damage with the Squirtle isn't really effective on Pac-Man just because of how much jank there is with the Fire Hydrant height difference, and there isn't really a lot of good ways to follow up on it. Uh, so you're going to have to see a lot of damage coming out from Ivysaur, but the problem is Ivysaur is really a low-damage projectile character that just wants to do, like, mid-range damage setups or kill confirms, uh, which is going to be really hard. Like, they're pretty even on percent. That up air... Did way more knockback than I thought it was going to do, but it looks like Pac-Man's about at kill percent right now. Up air, barely missing. Oh! If they hit that trampoline again, that would have meant death because the trampoline was red. Fire Hydrant coming out from downtown under the platform. Uh, looks like Cracker's trying their best to get in, trying to get some type of up. He can oh, no! The smash. Oh, that's so unfortunate for Quackers. That was his life flash before his eyes the moment that bell hit him there. And now Gothic Knights have taken the lead here. This is a pretty big upset in momentum. The fact that Purple is going to be able to move on towards Blue's final player for this set is so good for Gothic Knights. Even if Purple takes one stock, that is such a huge advantage going into the final set one stock up. What do you want to do, though? For SNHUs, they have to pick a player that really know they know they can get this one stock off Pac-Man without any harm, and on top of that, being able to play into the next player, which I'm not exactly sure, but it looks like we're switching to Crust. Uh, Crust plays a lot of Falco, so we're probably going to see that come out. Um, but yeah, it's going to be uh, it's going to be scary. Um, Falco is, is, I would say, pretty good in the Pac-Man because of Reflector, but... Yeah, that's going to be a really big thing in this matchup, is that Fire Hydra and all of those items, Purple's going to really need to think twice about throwing them, right? I mean, before, with a lot of zoning characters, you don't have to think twice about your projectile potentially flying back at you, you know? You throw your bell and you're like, okay, my bell is out, it's awesome, it's going to go in one direction, and that direction is straight towards my opponent. Uh, going against Falco, very different story, and especially if you're trying to sort of do a layered zoning game and throwing multiple projectiles at once, you know, throwing the fire hydrant and something else at the same time, that reflector can catch both of them. Yeah, Falco's Reflector also is not only used for reflection, but also used for some good mid-game zoning. Um, it's one thing, particularly with Falco, that makes them so good is that they have, like, two completely, like, separate play styles. I'm going to sit, I'm going to camp, I'm going to throw out down bees, and I'm going to throw out neutral bees to rack up the damage. Or I'm going to go all in and just cutscene combo you, and you're going to die. So... Being able to fall back on two entirely separate play styles is one of Crust's strengths. Like, we've seen Crust pull off some crazy clips like we saw earlier uh, in last set. Um, but, yeah, Crust do, it also does an insane job, as we saw also with last set, of being able to just sit back in zone, just being able to shoot lasers over and over and over again, like in that game walk game. I mean, one of the best parts about being a character like Falco, where you can really swap between that zoning game and that rushdown game, is that conditioning is such a big part of fighting games and of Smash. You really want your opponent to get used to you doing something so that when you switch it up, it catches them off guard. And Falco has to be one of the best characters for that, just because you're able to really do a super strong zoning game and then immediately start to fly at them with a blindingly flat, uh, blindingly fast rushdown. Um, they can really, really mix them up. Is Falco a traditional stance character? Come on. <laughs> I wouldn't say Come on. so. He doesn't he doesn't have any any stance swaps, right? I mean Aegis is more of a stance character. Yeah. Um, if anything, so... I think uh, you know, being able to switch between uh 
you know, rush rush down or not rush down, but you know, switch between zoning and and more up up close pressure is is very much kind of a hallmark of your traditional zoners. A lot of zoners do that. Yeah, and, and Falco is just one of those characters that's just so good, especially into like Pac-Man specifically. Um, yeah, being able to just get these grabs is just so good. And one thing that I'd love to commend Cross for is just their patience. Like, Cross is one of the most patient players on the team, just being able to sit back, sit completely still, and just wait for the other player to approach you. And as we see, this is exactly what Cross is doing, just trying to get rid of that Fire Hydrant, rack up that little bit of damage. Like, with these couple hits, no combo has been started yet, but already 56 damage onto the Pac-Man. Really nothing that Pac-Man can do, just off of just, like, basic grabs and downbeats. Like already built up a good percent lead but once they do get to that high percent it's going to be really easy for falco to go in and get some type of kill confirm with either up tilt or up throw we'll see purple finally finding a chance to get in trying to get some air time here on crust but he's going to be able to land back on the stage relatively unharmed good pressure there with the projectile is going to be able to cover a lot of space and now this fire hydrant already taking a hit there's just so much pressure that's on screen but crust will be able to sort of diffuse that and start to make his way in gonna get slapped in the face with a cherry and now back thrown as purple re-establishes that center stage has the bell ready this is scary. He is just going to throw it, going to pick it right back up. He's got to be very careful about this reflector. And you see Crust spamming because he really doesn't want to get hit by that bell. We're just sitting here, staring at each other, holding down our shield button. Uh, it's, it's, neither side is really too eager to engage. It's like, who's going to pull the trigger first? Yeah, bell thrown off stage. Uh, Pac-Man not having that anymore is very good, especially for Falco. Uh, Falco getting off a downer, but not able to follow up. Getting rid of Hydrant, though, is very good. Oh, being able to forward tilt uh, right before that apple was thrown. Uh, very, very good for Cross. Uh, this Fire Hydrant kind of seems like a, uh, kind of like a two-edged sword. Both good for Pac-Man, but also seems to be giving Cross a lot of agency in neutral, especially with being able to flick that the other direction. Fire Hydrant is one of those abilities that you just put it down and suddenly a whole new element to the match has actually popped up, right? Because you can't just ignore the Fire Hydrant if you're fighting against Pac-Man, and in a lot of cases, you can actually start to play around the Fire Hydrant yourself, and that is so important to be able to do, because you have to be able to be flexible like that, otherwise Pac-Man is just going to get full usage out of all of his utility. You have to be able to use some of it against him, and that is kind of really unique counterplay that's very matchup specific. And you'll only see a lot of players who are really experienced actually be able um, to use that Fire Hydrant against Pac-Man. Yeah, that's one big thing. Oh, but the bell just barely doesn't hit. Barely able to air dodge and actually grab ledge there. That was uh, that was surprising. I thought they were going to fall out. But yeah, going in for that back air. Reflector take agency over projectiles so it doesn't actually hit in that case. But the side B... Oh, into the up throw, up throw, too high of a percent to really do anything right now. Gonna have to land some type of back air, but the fire hydrant helped to push Crust with the water, something that you rarely see that really helps making moves stronger. And purple has completed his win condition here. He got value. That's all he needed to do. He, he came in with one stock and he found one of his own. He is more than happy to check out here because that is all he needed to do. Crust with two stocks left gonna have to take on the final player of the gothic knights it's gonna be an uphill battle for him and very much a advantageous situation for ng say or for ng njcu uh, we're really looking to close out this set pac-man just one of those characters that just is has so much agency over the match you know and as we mentioned before the goal is to just not fall so far behind that you know you you can't come back like pac-man was very able to make this comeback for njcu but yeah it's going to be a bit difficult on snhu to really figure out what they're doing next because yeah falco is one of those characters that can be countered uh it's a bit more difficult i'd say falco doesn't have as like volatile as a matchup chart as like mario does but i do think that uh falco does have some bad matchups that they could exploit uh hopefully snhu just took out all their players that could do that before they realized that SNHU was playing cross. Something scary about this set too, going right down to the wire like this. I mean, last time we fought, 
the Gothic Knights, it was a two to one set, right? It went all the way down to the final set. So uh, I, I hope you're ready for a long one tonight. It has already been uh, a pretty decent way into the hour, and we're only closing out our first set here. This is going to be a very tough fought match from both of these teams, and they're absolutely playing their hearts out, right? We're very close to the end of the bracket, uh, and, and whoever wins this is going to get to move on to lower finals and actually get to fight for a chance to go into grand finals. So... And we're getting right up to the end here. Both of these teams, this is what it's all been leading up to for them the entire season. So really just going right down to the wire like this, nerves are going to be such a big thing in this set. Yeah, that's one thing. I couldn't imagine, you know, really just like this is what you need to do to like get into grand finals. Like you have to get through this set. So for both of these teams, there's so much weight on their back to just carry their team, their players, their entire college, theoretically, into a grand finals of a big esports tournament. We'll see what, what, what Gothic Knights come out for for their final uh, character here. Hydra stepping up to the plate. This is a interesting matchup, right? Going into Falco, we don't even know what Hydra plays yet, but... Uh, Falco is a character who's got pretty decent matchup charts just because of his versatility. And so counterpicking into that is going to be pretty hard. You're probably going to see a very, very skill-heavy matchup to close out uh, set one, and that is going to be exciting. The big thing would probably be to look for like a bursty sortie, someone that can really do a lot to either get out of disadvantage and sort of make a comeback or also... Uh, be able to just rush down Falco so they don't have a time to spam, so they don't have time to spam projectiles. Uh, and that's really what they're going to want to look for, or maybe even theoretically a character like Game & Watch. Game & Watch is really annoying, just trying to maybe like run them down with some type of weird, odd character that maybe Cross isn't too familiar with, but looks like they're going to be playing into Smashville. And, and that's speaking, a bit scary. Speaking of spamming projectiles, like you said, uh, actually hearing that Hydra plays Palutena, so oh, into Falco, God. this is a weird matchup, right? Because you're going to still have that same kind of dynamic with the Reflector and kind of having to worry about that. But I think Palutena's zoning game is a lot stronger than Pac-Man's. This matchup is super bad for Falco. Not Well, not super bad. But like Palutena having safe out of shield options and the ability to counter Falco's projectiles, Palutena is just one of those kind of like... I call Palutena like the gatekeeper to high tier. Oh, and I yeah. feel like every care like Palutena, I wouldn't say is top tier, but I definitely say is the gatekeeper to high tier. Uh, one of those characters that just dominated the scene for so long until people just stopped playing them uh, because they realized there's characters with more of a tool set to offer. But yeah, 57 off of one string. It's just, it's so hard to do anything versus it. It's so, so much tough. pressure. It's, it's a rough situation to be in right here, and especially down a stock. Cross has to make up some ground quickly because Hydra has already started to put the pressure on extremely thick. Starting to move in now, already picking up some more damage. 115% for Cross is such a scary spot to be, and now he has to worry about actually landing back into the stage, and he's got to get spiked! It's insane! Uh, spiking, uh, like, Firefox is crazy. Oh my god, Palutena just flexing on their edge cancels with teleport. Palutena is definitely playing really good right now. One big thing to look out for for if they're a good Palutena or Mewtwo player is if they can teleport cancel, and that's probably the biggest thing to look out for. I know that this is probably a really difficult match for Falco. Uh, Palutena just has so much pressure. They can do just so much in this matchup, and Crush just doesn't have the time to breathe into Palutena at all. And as a very hardcore pressure character, you really feel that lack of a stock going into this match. If you're crossing, he's going to get spiked again out of Foxfire. That is insane. Being able to do that twice is so hard because it has a hitbox on it. Uh, that, that second time was before the hitbox came out, but that first time was just so... So insane to be able to land that spike, especially because Palutena's spike isn't the easiest thing to land. Uh, so yeah, uh, Gothic Knights taking that. Uh, looks like SNHU might have to switch around some type of team comp order uh, in general. But yeah, with Palutena in the back there, as we mentioned before, uh, yeah, that that anchor is going to be something that they're going to have. SNHU is going to have to get through. 
Yeah, it's really going to be interesting to see how SNHU change up their player order going into this next set because we definitely saw from SNHU really looking to try and start things off strong with a lot of their composition here. Um, but just kind of at the end there, Secret Weapon came out for Gothic Knights and Hydra showed up and absolutely just destroyed that was a incredibly decisive match right there that's going to be the big problem for snhu going forward here right snhu started off this set with a lead and gothic knights are able to come back and really start to apply some momentum on their own going into the final set with a lead that's a crazy turnaround and it really can't be understated how hard comebacks are in a, a format like crew battles right just because once you're down a stock you're kind of skewed to just lose that game it's a very punishing position to be in especially if you're down two stocks yeah that's one of the hardest parts about crew battle but really it's based off of team comp you really have to make sure that you put the right people in the right order and just hope that you can do the best you possibly can with what you have and that's one of the big things is that like you have to save the person that has a good matchup into palatina which I'm really not even sure if SNHU does have a good matchup into Palutena, because Palutena's matchup chart is kind of flat. Yeah, that's true. She is, like, like you said, I'm really glad that you mentioned that she is kind of the gatekeeper to high tier, because she is one of those characters that is just, like, what every low tier fears. You know, she is what makes low tier characters low tier, right? They don't have a way to get in, they don't have a way to deal with the projectile spam, or the yep. pressure that she can put out. in a lot of top characters really just go even with Palutena in terms of matchups. Yeah. And that's one of the big things. Palutena, even though you don't see them a lot, isn't a bad character. It's that they just don't offer any particularly good tools. Palutena, I would say, is probably the best all-rounder in the game. Like, if you want a character that is just, like, good, without having anything particular, you pick Palutena. And especially, like, talking about matchup charts, right? Like, and you mentioned that people really stop playing Palutena in a lot of sort of high-tier matches, right? And I, I like that you mentioned how she doesn't particularly give any sort of discrete advantages. Um, because that is really, like, when you look at, like, the absolute top tier of gameplay, those tiny little advantages are what give characters their sort of personalities right so you see characters who have matchup charts that you know they, they might be a little bit less uh commanding than palutena's but they have like a good matchup against other high tiers palutena doesn't have yeah. quite that advantage but yeah if you're going into that matchup with a uh if you're going into that matchup character can really matter because she has so many tools that a lot of the characters that are a little bit worse in the game don't quite have the ability to deal with and when you look at a character like falco right falco is really good at kind of that sort of weaving between a zoning game and a rushdown game palisade does kind of the same thing uh but just a little bit better and so for falco that's a very tough matchup the biggest thing about her is that she doesn't need kill confirmed. Her moves just kill. They have, true. like, Palutena has moves that are just good, that are good at pressuring, good at spacing, good at comboing, and then just move general moves that you aren't hard to hit that kill. Like, Palutena's back air is invincible, and it kills, and it's fast. It's faster than Falco's back air. It has less range, but when it's invincible, you kind of have no real recourse for just throwing it out. And that's sort of the big thing. And also they have great ledge trapping. Your smash attacks hit, you know, below ledge with up smash. Up smash covers jump as well. Then you have down tilt to sort of flip off ledge. And then so you could do a uh, reverse back air to hit them and just kill them there. Like there's so much that Palutena has that they're just good. They have nothing that particularly makes them good. They're just generally good at everything. They have moves that kill. They have moves that combo. They have moves that zone. They have great movement. They, it's just like, it's kind of a, uh, what What else would you want? Yeah, it, it, it can be tough. And on top of that, right, this is crew battles. So that's just one of four characters on your team. And one that they don't even necessarily have to pick, right? If Hydra doesn't want to play Palutena, uh, if, if they're going into a match and they already know what their opponent's character is, they can pick something that's a little bit better. But it looks like for our first match here for set two, we're going to have Swanky versus Zamu here. So this is going to be Samus versus Min Min right off the rip. I think Samus versus Min Min... Probably a good match to start out with. You know, Samus is one of those characters that is kind of difficult 
to like deal with, but we saw how good Min Min was into Samus previously. And just with how much Min Min can pressure this character. Zamu is starting to get in, trying to just find a little bit of pressure mid-screen, but Swanky already in a pretty good spot to start to get some of these pokes on early, and this is going to be really what, I mean, we saw this matchup before, we saw exactly how Swanky and Zamu tried to play it, uh, and Swanky is really going to be looking just to try and get in there uh, and play up close, right? So Zamu is going to have to worry about that. They're going to have to try and play a little bit more aggressive. They're going to have to get into Swanky's space and not let them actually do the things that they want to do. And we see them already starting to get close, starting to try and close the distance. Swanky trying to pull out some of their closer range options, still struggling a little bit at just resisting against Zamu's offense right here. Yeah, but the one big thing uh, is that this stage, I feel like it's not very good for SNHU. It's so big that Samus has a lot of options, you know. We saw this match previously on a lot smaller of a stage, and that's a lot better because Min Min actually has the agency to pressure Samus, but right now it doesn't seem like Min Min even has that ability. And a big thing as well is that when we when we saw this match before i mentioned that it's really hard to just not take damage against samus there's a lot of opportunities where samus can get in damage that feels really unavoidable we're gonna find a stock right off the rip right there but this big stage just allows zamu to pressure consistently and that means those uh percentages are going to get a lot higher a lot faster against samus here and that's one thing that you're going to have to watch out for is just the slow bleed of samus you know, they're already at 39% off of a couple interactions. And then just missiles is the rest. Missiles and neutral bees. That was a great dragon right there. Uh, most people find it really difficult to tech that situation. But Min Min's in a difficult situation, getting edge guarded by Samus. Obby will put them back off ledge. Goes for that sort of low. Looks like they uh, might have thought that Min Min was going to fast fall, try to go for a dunk. Great grab on that shield. Able to get back to ledge, but those bombs are just going to do a lot to just keep Min Min on the back foot. Uh, neutral bees just being charged, coming out. Min Min just doesn't have the agency in this match to do a lot. And now they're both at equal percents. Uh, Min Min's going to have to try to take a stock here. Uh, dash tag won't really kill, but will send Zamu into a sort of defensive situation. Yeah, Min Min just doesn't have the ability to really Edgar. Goes for the grab, but a Ooh. grab in return, and then that up air is a kill throw. So, yeah, that's just going to mean death for Altair Swanky. Zamu is still at three stocks right now. That is scary, especially because Zam uh, Samus can really just sit back and play the keep away game. Uh, we'll be able to take the first stock there off of Zamu, uh, but now you got to worry about just the, the advantage that they already have going into this. We talked about these pressure characters and how much they benefit um, from just having the slightest stock oh, lead. Oh no. no! That is so sad. Swanky can't make it back on stage and Zamu is gonna clean up that match with two stocks left. That's the hard part. This matchup, especially on a small stage, it's just so, so, or especially on a big stage, it's just so, so hard for Min Min. You can't really do a lot, and the only advantage you have, which is just pressuring Samus with a long arm, just isn't applicable because the stage is so big, and that's, yeah, that's just going to end up in Zamu being able to gimp Min Min with a bunch of down bees. That's a pretty scary start to this set. Being up two stocks for Gothic Knights, SNH, you're going to have to kind of fight back in a big way, but they got to be careful about which player they put up forward, right? If they put some really heavy hitters up, like Insignia now, then you got to worry about how far he can actually make it against this team. He was able to fight, I, I believe he took like five stocks last time he was on Insignia. So you got to be really careful about where you put these players, especially as we get further into this bracket. A lot of these teams are very much closer matched up, and you can't really just expect a single player to absolutely wipe through an entire team. Yeah, that's one of the hard parts, especially this close to Grand Finals. Like, these are the best of the best teams. Weeded out all the week for this tournament. Like, this is, like, basically deciding who's going to be third. Like, uh, like whoever right now wins is going to be tied with, uh, with Juniata. It's going gonna, it's gonna to be scary, especially for these teams. But just like how gothic knights made a comeback you know snhu also probably could as well looks like snhu's 
maybe playing Insignia, but maybe having a hard time really figuring out what they're going to do with Palutena after, you know, Insignia is gone, because they're probably going to save that Palutena for after that Corrin matchup, which is probably the best matchup that, you know, you have into Palu. Yeah, that, that's what you got to think about in this. The matchup charts, right? You're spending your Corrin here. To, to, to get as much value as they end up getting but this is where you're slotting them in and this is where they have to get value and it's gonna be hard right these players on gothic knights are not pushovers they're not just gonna let you walk up and three stock them I, unless they make me eat my words unless insignia makes me eat my words but they're going to make you pay and if that that could just be a, a single stock every matchup but that's still you know that attrition it's gonna add up over time and these really heavy hitter carries are gonna be just a little bit tougher and a little bit uh, less reliable than they have been in the past, but it looks like Insignia is going to be pulling out the Bowser for this one. Now, Bowser is their main, but we haven't seen them play Bowser in a very long time, so they might be a bit rusty, and especially into Samus, I could see this being a difficult matchup. I think Especially that... into characters like Palutena as well, or like even yeah. Pac-Man. But the one good thing about Bowser is that Bowser kind of is a very volatile character. You get a read, they die. You don't get a read, you get slowly chipped down over and over and over. And it's kind of one of those characters of like, you're so slow, you're so big that they can just bleed you out. But if they ever try to go in and you get one, I mean, one good yeah. read, they die. You get forward smashed at the ledge at 50, you're gone. On heavies too, a Bowser versus Bowser, that's still a death. For Bowser, right? You, yeah. One of the one of his things is his passive armor, his his tough guy stance, right? That's going to just passively reflect, or not reflect, but just just completely nullify the pushback and and stun from a lot of attacks. I'm curious as to how that interacts with Samus. I don't. I'm not particularly aware of it, but Samus if, can never jab. Yeah, that's the big thing. Never. Is Samus's really short range options? are not going to work. And that is what Samus really needs in some matchups. It's just buttons that she can throw out to say, get off me, you know, get off me now. And that's not going to be something that they can super rely on. So the zoning is going to have to be perfect. If I like Pokemon Stadium 2, I would have preferred to see a smaller stage. But, you know, if Insignia is confident, I definitely trust them. Um, but yeah, starting out with Fire, very good option, getting a little bit of percent onto Samus. But yeah, it, hopefully this matchup will go well. As mentioned before, Bowser can be down a lot and still, for some reason, just just win. Uh, I mean, Bowser Rage definitely is has not going to... Rage is going to help out even more with that as he gets the yeah. high percentages. Because Bowser's kill percent is like 120, like average. So yeah, it's going to be interesting. But one thing that I'm noticing, and I don't know why this is the case, but Bowser's falling out of a lot Whoa. of Samus's moves. Amazing combo by Samus there, using down air over and over and over again. But, you know, Samus won, what, uh, three, four interactions? Bowser won one, and Samus is at 83 right now. Only 20% difference. You would have thought that Samus is running this game. But, yeah, literally any move from Bowser right now will kill. Like, right. up, up till it forward smash, anything. But that back Whoa. air, perfectly red Insignia's jump. And with these big, <clears throat> with these big body characters, right, like Bowser, you got to consider their weight really plays into kind of how many interactions they're allowed to lose like that you know bowser's one of those characters who really wants to rush you down and his weight gives him a lot of opportunities to do that and mess up so for against a character like samus who is going to be able to get a lot of passive damage uh bowser's not going to care too much about that but we'll see zamu trying to get right back up on stage not a very scary percent but the forward smash not going to hit from insignia zamu will start to immediately start to apply some pressure bombs already going out not going to get hit in the same loop as before but insignia right on the ropes trying to get back up we'll be able to hop over the bombs avoid that ledge pressure zamu trying to just find something here and things are getting very scary for insignia but a good shot there from insignia is going to be able to send zamu right back out and right back down to the first or the last stock yeah that's one of the big things uh bowser just has the ability to do a lot like uh, one get up attack at 26 like, that's insane. But Bowser's at 186. It's definitely surviving a lot longer than they should. Is able to get back to stage, though. That last bomb barely catching them on the end of their Whoa! invisibility. And that up B barely doesn't kill. Insignia still having a little bit of time left at 216. Down B will actually spike Samus back on a stage, getting 66%. Any big move right now. Up smash. 
Barely doesn't kill. Chasing with fair almost did a lot right there. Oh, just barely missed the <laughs> up air. Zam is just doing so many uppies, whiffing so many attacks from both players. It's kind of, it's so much spaghetti, so much spaghetti. It's like an Italian mom's Thanksgiving. That but that side it. B, that's, they, live. they barely lived off that. You can oh. see these players panicking right now as they try and find their confirm, trying to find a kill, oh. and it will be another throw! Is this one gonna kill? It will! Insignia survives with two stocks remaining, and that was so scary for him. He wasn't in danger of losing this set by any means, but uh, he wasn't very much in danger of being brought down to just one stock remaining, and that would have been disastrous for SNHU in terms of building momentum for them. Yeah, that's one of the that's one of the things you don't want to keep things even. You don't want to keep things even. You want to slowly climb up, and especially pulling out Insignia now, having one of the only characters that can actually counter Palutena, you have to hope that Insignia will it get you back to neutral, but even more than get you back to neutral, uh, because you have to be aware that Palutena is always in the back, and you don't have a good answer to it. I want to know what Gothic Knight's answer to this is. Because Bowser is a character who can really get in and really mess up a lot of other characters, right? And I, I figure that Palutena probably has a pretty decent matchup into Bowser. I, and I would think that it's a little bit early in the set for that to come out. But if Insignia is out already, it might be time for Gothic Knights just to try and pull this out to, to be able to take him out of the running uh, and start to make up some uh, ground with their Palutena. Palutena chart is basically completely flat for anyone that isn't in top tier. Like, it is, it is entirely flat. So, like, into Bowser, I could see it literally being flat. Like, I think that Bowser can get a couple good things on a Palutena. Palutena dies. But Neutral B is going to be a pain. Tough Guy isn't really good into that matchup. But being able to survive a long time is good. But now Palutena's Nair String and Up Air String is going to probably do a lot more. Probably get you to, like, 70-ish because it can probably weave in an extra Nair and maybe an extra Up Air. But Rampage coming out, we saw Rampage's Joker... Being so vital in that early game uh, with Insignia that, you know, if they're going to play Joker again, I'm not sure if that's actually the best matchup. I feel like Bowser can kind of stop that. Yeah, this is going to be interesting. I mean, I guess the hope here, right, is that Bowser is going to be combo food. And for Joker, I'm sure that's absolutely the case. He's probably going to be able to pick up some but, pretty decent combos onto Bowser. But you really got to worry about those really fast options from Joker just completely getting uh, neglected by Tough Guy. The best way that I'll describe Joker is kind of like most people think they're a combo character because Joker doesn't really fit a traditional playstyle in Smash. There aren't a lot of characters like this, but uh, Joker is mostly a whiff punish character. Like a very easy, quick, simple kill confirms, uh, neutral pressure with gun, and just pressure in general. But in general, they pressure you to make a stupid option and then they dash back and then fair one you and then you're in a, a tiny combo. So it's basically just slow pushing pressure. It's kind of weird because you wouldn't necessarily call it a whiff punish character, but they also have good neutral. It's kind of kind of a weird state, but I feel like that's not really good into Bowser. What do you whiff punish? How do you pressure with gun? Gun will just do a little bit of damage, but you can kind of tough guy through it. So it's gonna be it's gonna be a weird matchup. I'm not exactly sure who wins, but I'd say that probably Bowser would win it. A lot of uh, you know, there's kind of a a a. Uh perception that bowser is a slow character and right obviously no. we we watch the stream we know that's not true right um his, he is extremely fast moving and his moves come out extremely fast but his recovery can be a be, be a little bit long on some of his yeah. moves and so that's that's, what, that's where that perception of him being a slow character comes from is because he can get moves out really fast but if he whiffs them that could be a problem so i could see this potentially um exactly what that joker's going for with like you mentioned the yeah. punishes and things like that that's gonna be something that signia has to go with but that's just also one of those characters where um his tilts and smash attacks are so huge you i don't know how you whiff them yeah that's kind of the big thing and in general you really just have to watch out for arsene but joker until arsene is kind of just food for bowser and then once arsene comes out you know then you actually get a chance to kill gun's really the only thing i'm afraid about like giving a recovery but in general, Joker just doesn't have the pressure to really deal with Bowser, I would say, unless Joker's really confident. Like, no safe out of shield, no safe on shield options. Bowser can just up be you, exactly like we see. Yeah, and just edge guard, but Arsene's out right now, and that could be a problem, especially because of back airs. But Signe is doing a great job reading all of the habits of Rampage right now. Not perfectly reading the role, but definitely uh, fading away just to be safe. 
Uh, stuck on platform right now is going to be hard, but yeah, gun's going to be going to be a big thing with punishing uh, that side B. Uh, but Arsene's gone now, and it didn't really get as much as you needed it to. Dash coming out from Bowser, actually landing the soft spot right there. But side B, not on platform, so won't kill. But at 145 and at 65 for Insignia, it's definitely going to be interesting. That Ooh. fade hard air is so huge for Insignia. Rampage now evened up on terms of stocks. Insignia hasn't taken too much damage, still at 67%. Not anywhere close to kill range uh, for Joker here. Rampage tries to find something to good to grab from Insignia. Gonna scoop him right up, bring him right over towards the ledge. Arsene almost out. We'll see. Starts to get in. We'll be able to pick it up soon. These, these grabs are really great here. Forcing Insignia all the way across the stage. Rampage finally going to be able to pull out his persona and start to get things going here on stage as he starts to pull up a little bit of a combo. Bowser air dodging back to center stage is really big for Bowser. Side B coming out, sending Bowser off, but that down air will actually almost combo into that back air, but actually manage to trade in Joker's favor. A barely fell out of that up B and that dash tag just barely doesn't kill. Bowser's at 180 right now, and that counter is just going to mean death. That was a fantastic counter. Arsene going back in the bag. Rampage is also going to see his way out down to the final stock for both players. Seven to seven. Things are tied up for the two teams. Yeah, and this is huge for Insignia. Being able to get this much utility being down, uh, definitely something you're going to have to watch out for in the future. Fading away with that uh, up tilt is very powerful. Charging up that up smash, but Rampage doesn't take the bait right there. Uppy, you know, doing anything it can to carry Bowser's bad disadvantage. Uh, but Joker has Arsene right now, and Insignia really has to try to play it safe, hoping that Joker doesn't get out a big combo. Looks like one happened, though, with two up airs. Still a lot of damage, but not a lot of actual moves. Um, Insignia stuck on platform again, and that's really the hardest part about Bowser. You have no way off. Fair will send Joker off stage. Joker's at 94. So that oh. forward tilt will mean death. Forward tilt is just so meaty. That thing will kill when you absolutely don't expect it to. Rampage getting sent right on back to the bleachers. Gothic Knights now down a player, SNHU, holding on to their lead. And Insignia making sure that he gets his value out. But like I said, Gothic Knights are not going to let him just win rounds for free, right? Rampage took a stock off of him. Uh, he's down to his final stock. Insignia's got one yeah. life left, and he's got six to take and from the other team. So this next match is probably not going to be one that he can win, but one where he's just trying to do as much damage as possible. And the big thing as well is that Insignia has brought it back to neutral. This is basic ne neutral game state. But the big thing is you need it to be better than neutral. Pulling out your anchor right now in a crew battle while the enemy team still has their anchor in the back is going to mean that you're going to have to get more. You're going to have to put yourself in a huge lead to hopefully combat that Palutena in the back because, as mentioned before, there aren't really that many good options. That's definitely going to be something that's on the mind of SNHU Blue right now as they format themselves going forward in this set. Gothic Knights, who they send out next, could really change up the game. Insignia with one stock left. You got to wonder, like, hey, do we just send someone out who can probably get one? Or do we want to try and just get in there, make this last stock easy, and then start to snowball? But you also got to consider the offside of that, right? If you get your anchor out now, like you said then they're going to get counterpicked in some situations. Palutena is a pretty safe character in, in terms of that, but then you won't run into like the Falco Palutena matchup, right? Because you'll know what you're sending in. Yeah, that's a big thing, though, is that right now, Gothic Knights have really no reason to pull out their Palutena, and the SNHU doesn't really have a good option like for anything are. else. They are. This is huge for... SNHU, if they can get any amount of stock, any leeway on this Palutena is going to mean a lot, especially because you can counterpick it now with either Mario, Pokemon Trainer, or Falco, um, which aren't really any good matchups in that in that pool that I just mentioned. But if Insignia can take even any amount of stock, it's gonna be it's gonna be huge for SNHU. The, the name of the though, game. The name of the game here, right, is pressure, though, and Hydra has that stock advantage, which is going to be so scary for Insignia. Yeah, it's going to be really terrifying, especially because 
Palutena actually has options for pressuring Bowser, unlike Joker. Joker is really a whiff punish character. You want neutral to kind of be even, and you kind of just want to win trades as best you can with, like, back air. But the hard part is, is that, you know, Bowser now, facing Palutena, doesn't have the ability to really do anything or have any agency in a match. However, this is start. probably their best matchup into Bowser, because I wouldn't say Pac-Man's very good. Yeah, this is, I mean, at the very least, it's going to be even, right? We've been talking about Palutena's matchup chart this whole time. It's time to see it in action as we get into this. Not where you would expect to see either of these players played in this crew battle. But Insignia, with one stock left, is going to try and do as much damage as he can to Hydra and is going to immediately start off with some good pressure. One big advantage that Bowser has in this match is Bowser actually has a very good out-of-shield option, which is up B, one of the better out-of-shield options in the game. But... The hard part is that Palutena has very good edge guards versus Bowser, and Bowser's recovery is probably the weakest attribute of the character. These nares are just going to mean kind of the end for Bowser, but one little hit in a couple uppies will put Palutena at 43, but Insignia is already at 100. This is looking pretty dire, especially because there isn't really any option except for up B that you can use, and that move is eventually going to get stale. Tries to read a jump out of teleport with the side B, but didn't actually come out in time. Uh, Insignia just trying to find any way to get back to stage. Uh, and it doesn't seem like you have the Ooh. ability to, and that back air is just going to mean death. It's one of those situations, right, where we saw Bowser trying to get back up onto the stage, and because Bowser's recovery is so poor, he was forced to resort to a lot of really high, highly committal actions. And because of that... Uh, Hydra was just able to get so many whiff punishes. So many grabs came out while Insignia was still recovering from the moves that he used to try to get back onto stage. The moment that Hydra got the ball rolling in terms of pressure, it was it was over. There was nothing Insignia really could have done in that situation. Um, it's just a very, very hard game to play trying to recover into Palutena, especially if your recovery is already weak. Yeah, it's just so hard. You know, one of the benefits to Bowser is the up, you had a shield, but when you can't even shield because you're in the air or on ledge, it kind of takes that benefit completely away, and that's one of the one of the hardest parts about that matchup in general. Paltena just being that gatekeeper as we see constantly, and there really isn't an option. Like, I'd say Pokemon Trainer maybe has the best, but Pokemon Trainer doesn't have any good out-of-shield options. Maybe you pull out Mario and hope for some big explosive combo maybe to get Palutena out there's definitely a possibility but Palutena zoning options are just so powerful into a character like Mario like Fireball doesn't mean anything Fireball doesn't do a lot there um so it's just gonna be hard but as we saw before Falco is just such a like Falco is just such a bad character into Palutena that you can't pull that out either so it's like it's just it's just hard it's just a hard situation the, the matchup here is interesting. Steven coming out, pulling the Mario through to try and take down Palutena. Uh, this is going to be very much looking to try and get in on Palutena before she has the chance to really apply a lot of pressure, which was the main issue in the last set, right? Uh, Insignia versus Hydra. There just wasn't enough time for Insignia to get in and apply pressure on Hydra. And once Hydra did start to apply pressure, not a lot of options there. Mario, very much an all-rounder, has a lot of options at any point in the game, has a lot of offstage options, Options as well um, and just a lot of ways to approach you with his super fast move speed and a lot of approach tools and this is something that you know you're gonna have to watch out for but the major thing that I think is gonna define this game is really whether Steven can close these stocks out early before Palutena has the time to build pressure it's gonna be hard but you're gonna have to try to get some type of crazy spike off but Steven's been playing extremely well as we've seen uh, so that's something that you're going to have to watch out for. Good parry from Steven. Not going to find too much to actually follow up on that, though. There's going to be a lot of movement happening here in the neutral game. Neither side really wants to get stuck uh, attacking into shield because both these uh, characters have some pretty good out of shield options to, to work with. Steven trying to just get in is going to find himself receiving some of that pressure. Is able to get back, back up on the ledge, but Hydra playing just around the perfect sort of space to continue to pressure the ledge. But Steven will be able to get back up, be able to take center stage, start to try and find something. But already he is all the way back over towards the ledge and has a pretty big life deficit here. 
yeah, that's one of the hard parts, but here's the biggest thing with Mario. Mario can explode a character in three seconds. Any opening on Mario could mean death for the Palutena, especially if Steven can pull off the combos. Hardest part right now is that Mario can't really get to the ground easily, especially with those up airs and nares. Trying to do their best to weave in and out of pressure, but it's got to be scary, especially when you have Palutena having such a strong option like back air. And oh. that counter, that might mean death, yeah. That just means death for Steven. Up B, unfortunately, it is a strong recovery tool, but it's a little bit linear, and against a counter or against a character with a great counter like Palutena, it can be tough. Steven's gonna start to find something here, trying to get the ball rolling, but Hydra is just such good uh, air normals to really be able to control a lot of space. But still, Steven, he's in there, not gonna be able to find the kill that he's looking for, but Hydra right back on the stage. We're already back to neutral. Nice! Steven, just seeing that Palutena is just going to keep narrowing on the side, hoping that it's uncontestable, but that forward smash perfectly timed for when Palutena lands. Hydra just trying to sit around the right side of the stage here, is able to get Steven over towards the ledge, and that was scary. Not going to quite hit the ledge, but Hydra not quite ready to be able to counter that. We'll be able to get right back on, and that recovery is so strong. Any recovery you see where the person can just teleport is going to be very tough to deal with because you don't know exactly where they're going to go, and it, you can't really interrupt them in the middle of the teleport. You just have to try and read where you think they want to teleport. Definitely, and that's one of the... One of the big parts, especially with the stage pick, I feel, is that, oh, amazing back air from Palutena just perfectly reading the ledge, but Mario doesn't have good options for up smash because Palutena can just teleport high, land on the platform, and then what can Mario do? That traded like that, up he didn't hit Palutena there. That's, that's a bit crazy, but looks like it's going to be a hard time for Steven to really try to get any kind of neutral... Uh, ladders are kind of out of the question right now, unless looks like maybe they are finally just being at 74. Steven's going to have to look out for really any, any kind of like big smash attack or something, maybe a little bit more damage, but a great projectile combo coming out from Palutena at the edge, putting Steven at 91%. Uh, definitely a scary situation. Any smash attack from Palutena can kill. Trying to throw out a good explosive flame right there, but Nair follow-up oh. will stop. And that back air reading where Steven's exactly going to fly and hitting Steven right in the face. Really strong looking here for... Uh, Hydra especially. Only losing one stock in that match was so important there. Um, as the anchor, you want to try and be able to keep your presence uh, as much as you can. You don't want to go out early. You don't want to have to bow out because someone took two stocks on you in a single game. And if they continue to play at this pace, they are in a great spot going into SNHU's final fighter. I really wonder who it's going to be. SNHU doesn't have a lot of good options right now. Because you're going to have to deal with both a Pac-Man and a Palutena. Pokemon Trainer is probably the best, but that game versus that Pac-Man was really close, especially with Quackers. And I don't see Min Min having a good matchup into this. I don't see any of Cruss's side characters uh, being really good into this either. It looks like Falco is going to come out. We're seeing the Falco come out into the Palutena matchup. Maybe looking to feel a little bit more confident going into this one, but still uh, very scary. Very scary overall to go into this matchup. Falco really likes to be able to take the space he needs and to be able to, to uh, sort of play at the pace that he wants to. He's very, very big at controlling the game. And if he's not quite able to do that, especially against a character like Palutena, who really just kind of controls a lot of the stage generally, has a lot of tools to control the tempo of the game, can be very hard for Falco to really start to find his stride. Now, I will say that Pokemon Stadium 2 is probably a better stage for Falco than is for Mario, um, but this is still really scary. I, I want to know how Crust is going to change up his game plan here, right? If there is ever a time for the nerves to be up, it's right now, right? You are the last player on the team. And you're facing elimination right now in the tournament, you know? You are you are the only thing holding your team back from elimination. And first off, you have to go through Hydra. You have to go through two stocks of Hydra, and then whoever Gothic Knights have as their final player. That is intimidating. You have five stocks to take, you only have three, and you're just one guy. All down to you. Yeah, 
is one of the scary parts. However, Hydra does have a stock down. Uh, a couple lasers will be in uh, Cross's favor, but already getting nared a couple times is going to be hard. And you can't really even up B because the problem with that is you got spiked twice. So how do you get back? And then side B, problem with that is you get down tilted. There's really no angle that you can get back to stage easily. So you just have to hope that you never, ever get into that position really where you're off stage. Yeah. And that's just a pickup from Palutena, perfectly placed. Teleport cancels. Really good right now. This Palutena is definitely looking hot right now. For us right now, playing. just has to just has to try and control space, right? And you see him. I mean, just sitting back playing it, kind of the way he has been. But unlike a lot of the other characters he's faced, he's gonna have to play a little bit more aggressively. Hydra is gonna be more than happy to sit back, and especially with Cross off stage, you cannot be put in these situations where you have to Foxfire. We've seen how this plays out. Yeah, this is a very difficult situation. Gets the back air confirmed, though. Uh, goes out deep, though. Just barely not able to. Wave bounce up B. Caught that. That's insane. I think that was probably missed input. Oh, oh, oh. But the spike coming out from Cross. This might be the momentum shift that Cross needs. One stock to one stock right now. Good combo starter coming out from Cross. Reading the air dodge, but wasn't able to follow up just in the right amount of time. Gets pressured themselves on the back foot. Shields on platform. Palutena having full advantage over the situation. Cross gets back to ledge. Palutena just trying to do their best to ledge with that back air. Another back air coming out from Palutena. Cross is just kind of sitting around figuring out what the Palutena is going to do. Trying to read their options. Um, gets hit by another back air. Uh, gets hit by another Nair, sent off stage right now. Side B is over Palutena, able to air dodge perfectly. Tries to go for a pivot grab, but Palutena jumps in that situation. Jab just barely coming out, but that jump Ooh. off side B will be shielded in oh. that back air from Palutena. Will seal the game. That is unfortunate. Immediately go right back to the home screen. That is Gothic Knights closing out the set, closing out the Knights. <laughs> this is completely off the air on that switch but that is an incredible performance from them really great play from hydra to close out that game and, and overall just close out the set in a great way unfortunately snhu that means they are down and out but they are your uh they are your semi-finalists for the cruise playoffs uh in the necc northeast really great performance from them all semester they've looked really strong but gothic knights man they are just another team yeah, that's one of the one of the terrifying parts about tournaments is that, you know, you kind of get checked. You kind of you're going to have to face a team that is just a bit better than you. But SNHU doing really good. I'm not exactly sure where they stood last season, but basically being tied for third, I think, with um, the other team that Gothic Knights beat, which was, I believe, the Golden Gales. Um, so, yeah, absolutely well played. Uh, and yeah, Smash Team on air. Last time we'll see them this <laughs> semester. Quackers just kind of sitting there a posing. Lo love to see the guys out there. I mean, at least having a good time, even in defeat. Can't feel too bad about that. Sometimes you do just face teams that are really just another level. But super happy to see these guys still in high spirits. Especially, you know, they're they're being they're being very nice, very inclusive to to Osiren there, an Overwatch player. He's right up among the ranks of the Smash Team. And this is why we love the Smash team. Even when they're down, they can still pull out jokes like this, just pointing at the camera. Overall, really great performance from them all semester. And <laughs> hope definitely, uh, you know, if you if you enjoyed watching Smash here on stream, be sure to keep it tuned. <laughs> That's Steven loves getting up in the camera. It cracks me up every time. But if you like if you like watching Smash, if you like watching our crew battles, be sure to stay tuned to our Twitter at SNHU Esports. Be able to check out all sorts of updates for our games coming up into the next semester, as well as anything related to that, such as Granite State Grind coming up on May 20th. Be sure to check it out. Fight to qualify in the New England Smash Invitational. It's gonna be a very fun and competitive time. But that's all for us tonight we will be back uh on thursday with overwatch 2 playoffs so we will see you then until then enjoy the rest of your night enjoy the rest of your night
Peace.